Today, the topic is going to be the uh, ethnic people of Crested Butte. Next week, as I told you before, we are going to have Pete Dunda here with his accordion. We're going to have music, and we're going to have free pizza. So I need to get a little poll from the group here. I'm going to name a couple of pieces of pizza, and uh, you tell me if you like them so I kind of know what to order. Pepperoni, raise your hands. Uh, sausage. You guys are easy. Canadian uh, pineapple. It's all good. So nobody eats. Now remember, when you come in next week, everybody bring their own drinks. So I have no idea what you like to drink. And beer and hard liquor is not allowed at the school. So anything less than that. Uh, no wine either. No hard, no hard liquor. I, I, are they going to throw me out of here? Um, so anyway, uh, what I'd like to do is introduce Pete right now. Pete and Susan have come down to uh, hear this. Sure. How many people want vegetarian? What do we got? One, two. Yeah, I'll get, I'll get a nice uh, vegetarian, too. You bet. We'll get a good sample. Pete, come on up. Pete and Susan. Susan, stand up. Pete, give Pete a nice round of applause. Come on up here, Pete. Pete, Pete is well known in the Gunnison country. Absolutely wonderful gentleman. A great polka band. And uh, he is of an ethnic group himself. And I want him to take a minute or two and just tell you what we're going to do. Uh, one of the things we are going to do is anybody doesn't know how to polka is not going to leave here not knowing how to polka. And we may even have a shotish or two. So, Pete, you're you know. on. Fill them in what you're going to do, a little history and... Yeah. Well, I'll uh, start the program off with the uh, history of the accordion. And there are three major types of accordions that are quite different. So I'll go into that a little bit, and, and then I'll get, uh, get into the history of the accordion as it happened in Crested Butte, and why, and the different ethnic people that, uh, that brought it in with them. Uh, the main reason, it reminded them of the old country where they came from. The accordion was the link you, you need to speak a little louder. Oh, I do. Can't hear me? <laughs> there you go. I'm a little hoarse. Well, anyway, uh, the history of the accordion and then uh, uh, the history of the accordion in Crest of You and uh, the uh, famous uh, bars and saloons where it was used. Uh, 17 total of bars and saloons in the town at that time. So, uh, and then uh, uh, I'll demonstrate um, the different types of polkas, because they're all different. You've got German, you've got Polish, you've got uh, uh, Slovenian, Cleveland style, like Yankovic, uh, uh, and you've got the lighter uh, side, like Myron Florin with Lawrence Welk, a little, little bit different. Um, so we'll, we'll play a little bit of that. And as Dwayne says, uh, hopefully we can get some dancing going. And uh, uh, any questions you have on the accordion at that time, I'll be glad to, uh, to answer your questions. And I think I'll bring three or four accordions and have them here and kind of point out the difference uh, for you. And uh, uh, when you go out of here, you'll be an accordion affectionado. <laughs> <laughs> so that's about it. Thank you, Pete. Right. So on, uh, on next Thursday, the hills will be alive with the sound of music. <laughs> Blow. Um, the 17 bars? And saloons here in town. 
What, what do you? What? He just mentioned there were seventeen. Oh, seventeen bars and what saloons. Year? What year? It was about. Uh, oh, you know, the, uh, right. The best years of Crested Butte were right before World War One and during World War One. So that would have been it. Yeah. Nineteen ten to nineteen eighteen, right in there. Yeah, that's when the mines were really hopping. World War One was going on, and yeah, you bet. All right, folks, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is uh, tell you a little bit about what I uh, left off with last time. Didn't quite have my glasses with me. And you get a little old, I can read everything from far away, but not real good close up. So we're going to start off with this, with the Statue of Liberty, which is called the New Colossus. And it goes like this. Not the brazen giant of Greek fame with conquering limbs astride from land to land. Here at our sea-washed sunset gate shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning and her name, Mother of Exiles. From the beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air bridge harbor that twin cities frame. Keep ancient lands your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. It's a little emotional. And we are, obviously, a nation of immigrants. Immigrants came to the United States for a variety of reasons. And one of the reasons was hard times. In the old country, people were poor. The class system. If you were in the lower class in the old country, you never had a chance to rise out of it, no matter how hard you worked. And in addition, hope. I already told you about the story involving my grandfather who came from Belgium and I asked my dad one time why didn't grandpa go back to Belgium and see his brothers and cousins and my dad said because he thinks if he goes something happens he's not going to be able to get back. They weren't particularly interested in going back to the old country and everybody called it the old country. They were here for a reason and you know they were damn lucky that they got here. So you know, we have a lot of people now who are grandsons and granddaughters who go back. And it's nice to go back and see where grandpa and grandpa, uh, grandmother grew up. But times were very difficult back in those days, and they were very happy to get to the U.S. 33 million immigrants came to the U.S. from 1865 to 1900. That's about a million a year. And they made tremendous contributions, and the United States became a nation of immigrants or a melting pot. Now, I can go around this room. I'll start off with myself. My dad is born in Belgium. My mother is Scotch, Irish, and German. So I'm one half Belgian, one six Scotch, one six Irish, one six German. There's probably nobody in this room that is 100% of one, one thing. And that's what makes the United States a great country. Because we don't have, and I'll be getting to this in a little bit, we don't have the ethnic feuds that they had in Europe with one valley, one ethnic group, and another valley, another ethnic group, and they all hate each other. That's still true today in the Balkans. It's still true today in Bosnia. It's still true today in Serbia. And it's still true today in a lot of countries. Here are the three things that the immigrants did and still do today. Number one, they did the back-breaking work that nobody else wanted to do. They still doing that today? When I was on a farm uh, a long time ago as a young kid, I picked potatoes by hand. Once every three or four years, he'd raise potatoes. And I can tell you that picking a row of potatoes one quarter mile or 140 long, putting them in a wicker basket and then putting them into a burlap sack and then tying the burlap sack when it was full, at the end of the day, you are exhausted and your back feels like it's going to break. 
and I was 13 or 14 years old. You go out to California, see those people picking strawberries and lettuce, and they're not 13 or 14 years old. And I don't know too many people who are not immigrants who are willing to work in the fields like that. Secondly, they made the United States the richest culture in the world. There is no nation in the world that is the melting pot that is the United States. Nobody in the world, no nation in the world has all the different ethnic groups that the United States has. And lastly, these are the people who increased the population of the U.S. in settled areas where a lot of other people didn't want to go. The Great Plains. Anybody's ever read Hamlin Garland or Willa Cather or Maria Sandoz or E.V. Rolvog? It's heartbreaking. Hamlin Garland once said when he wrote The Middle Border, he said there's a lot of stuff that he couldn't write about the women on the Great Plains because he said, my pen would not shed its ink. Couldn't bear to write it. That's how painful it had been. The old immigration came from Northwestern Europe. England, Ireland, Scotland, Scandinavia, Germany, and they were called wasps. White, Anglo, Saxon, Protestants. They spoke the English language, and they were white, and they were accepted because they looked a lot like the people who were already out on the East Coast or maybe even in the Midwest. They were also referred to as Cousin Jacks and Cousin Jennies when they worked in the mines. Many of them went into farming in the Great Lakes in the Midwest. I mean, my father and grandfather would be a good example of people who did that. And others became some of the best hard rock miners in the world. And remember the first day, I think, in the class, I talked to you about Nathan Hill, who was the guy who decided that to find out how to reduce that complex gold ore that we had in Colorado, that nobody else had ever been able to reduce because of its complexity, the place he went to to find if you could actually reduce it was Wales. Those guys been working in the mines for 700 years. And if they couldn't reduce it, it couldn't be reduced. And they reduced it. And Nathan Hill came back, and five years later, he devised the final process to separate the gold from the copper mat that the Welch miners had showed him how to put it on. The southeastern Europeans came to the cities and the coal mines. They came from Austria, Italy, Later on, what is known as Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia. There are, for instance today, people, more Polish people that live in Chicago than any city in Poland. There are more Jewish people living in New York City than live in any other city in the world, including Israel. The early view of immigrants was that they would conform to Anglo-Saxon patterns of behavior and be assimilated. Now, unfortunately, that's what happened in my family, and that's what it, the way it was back, you know, 50, 60 years ago. You, you know, they wanted you to speak English. They wanted you to use Anglo-Saxon customs. And I regret it. To this day, I mean, I wish I had learned the French language or the Flemish language. Because when you're five or six years old, if I, if I were running the educational system in the United States, there are two things that I would do to kids that are four or five years old. Number one, they're learning a foreign language. They'd have it down pat by the age of six because they're not intimidated. I remember when I was in school, they had a song, and you people have heard of it. Yeah. Frère Jacques, Frère Jacques, dorme fou. Hell, I learned that in 18 seconds. Brother John, right? But unfortunately, at that time, everybody was taught 
to be a, quote, American, unquote. That's not the way it should have been, and it's certainly not the way that it should be today. More about that in a moment. Later views wanted immigrants to maintain their identities. Fortunately, in many ways, that is true today. The great Mary Anton, one of the great writers who came to the United States, and she was an immigrant, she said this, We came not empty-handed here, but brought a rich inheritance. So when those people came to the U.S., I, I, I talk about philology. And philology as a word that came from the Brothers Grimm, Hansel and Gretel, children's tales from Germany. And philology is defined as the folk spirit of a people. Langu you can tell a lot about a people by knowing their language, their customs, their art, their traditions, their music. That's what's important. That's how you can tell about people. Philology. And that's what those people brought to the United States. And unfortunately, for a long time, we didn't recognize the importance of this. Here are some of the great people who came from foreign countries to the United States. Alexander Graham Bell, telephone. Joseph Pulitzer, newspaper, Pulitzer Prize. Nikola Tesla, the greatest man in electricity who ever lived and the guy who came up with alternating current. Czechoslovakian, Louis Agassiz, Birds of North America, one of the great nature painters of all time, came to Colorado as an older man in his late 60s and he looked at the San Juan and he looked at the Elk Mountains and he began to cry. And he said, I have come here so late cursing himself for not knowing about the great mountains of North America. Think of all the great birds he could have painted, all the, all the great nature he could have painted. John Peter Altgeld, the governor of Illinois and a great friend of the working man. Jacob Reese, R-I-I-S, who wrote How the Other Half Lives, writing about the immigrants of New York City living in tenement houses, uh, four to five families to... Uh, you know, about three rooms. When Teddy Roosevelt, the governor of New York, read Jacob Reese's book, he sent him a letter and he said, I have read your book and I've come to help. Samuel Gompers, who started the American Federation of Labor Union. Andrew Carnegie, a Scottish immigrant who made $450 million when he sold his steel mills to U.S. Steel, and then gave everything away to libraries and philanthropy. You go through Leadville today, just when you make that turn going out of town, you look on the left side of the road, it says Carnegie Library. His idea was anybody who died with more than $1,000 had wasted everything. Can't take it with you. Let's do something good for the people. E. V. Rolvog, in a great novel about the upper Midwest and the farms, Giants in the Earth. A legendary story about a guy who was very ill. E. V. Rolvog's man, the guy he's writing about, is called Per Hansa, Norwegian immigrant. And Per Hansa's wife is mentally unbalanced. She's lost too many children. Uh, there's no reading material. She just lost it. Most women on the prairie ran into that. And she demanded that he go and try and help the guy who was ill. And he disappeared into a snowstorm. And the next May, said E.V. Rolvog, two boys playing around a haystack found a man sitting there with his stocking cap pulled well over his head and his skis on the side, and he said that he was, his face was turned towards the west. He's dead. He froze to death. But in freezing to death, he was pointed towards hope. 
the west. He was not pointed towards the east. If you ever have a chance to read E.V. Rolvog, I guarantee you, you'll love it. A reaction came very early against immigrants. Labor opposed immigration because it filled up the labor force and drove down wages because there were so many of them. Social reformers opposed immigration because of slums, poor health, exploitation of the poor, which stayed as long as illiterate immigrants came in. And then the last people who opposed immigrants were Nordic supremacists, the Adolf Hitler crowd. If you're not blue-eyed, blonde, white, and an Anglo, you got to be an inferior race. Unfortunately, there's still a little bit of that around today. The way to keep immigrants out of the United States was by passing literacy tests, which immigrants obviously couldn't pass because a lot of them couldn't read English, and establishing federal laws and quotas, like the Immigration Acts of 1917 and 1924. You got people coming in from Ireland and England, uh, you got a big quota. You got people coming in from Yugoslavia and Serbia and Austria, you got a low quota. Immigration is geared to bring those people in from Northwestern Europe and keep that other riffraff, they thought, out. Blatantly discrimination. The early foreigners who came to Crested Butte were from Canada. Al and Fred Johnson, from Norway, from Sweden, and from the British Isles. And their names were Ross and Gardner and McNeil. And they were sprung from the reality of the British coal mines. These, a lot of these people who came had been miners before. And in England, boys went into the mines at eight or nine years old and many of them never lived to see much of the light of day. Because they went into the mines early in the morning and it was dark. The mines were dark themselves. They came out late when it was dark. They worked seven days a week. They died of black lung at the age of 19 or 20. And the only reason they were in the mines at all was that some of the seams were so small that only the little kids could get in and mine. Spit them up, spit them out. In the mines of Crested Butte, they always said that you didn't want a mule to die because it cost 200 bucks. If a guy died, you get another guy off the boat. Don't worry about it. Give uh, $5 to the flower fund and bury him and bring another guy in. There's a great movie that I hope everybody has an opportunity to see. And raise your hand if you've seen it. How Green Was My Valley? Anybody seen that movie? One of the great movies of all time about the coal miners in Wales. Large numbers of immigrants were attracted by the coal mines in the U.S. And for the first 15 years, almost all of the people from Crested Butte came from the British Isles with names like Ross Gardner and McNeil. The Denver and Rio Grande Railroad, built into Gunnison in 1881 and then built into the Black Canyon. And as it built into the Black Canyon, Irish and Italian laborers were the workmen and they didn't like each other. In October of 81, an Austrian worker by the name of Pete Theophile after not being paid on time and being hit by his boss, a man named William Hoblitzel, shot the contractor in the breast with a pistol, killing him. He fled. Seven miles down the Black Canyon, but he was caught by Sheriff George Ewell and deputies. He was put in jail at four o'clock in the afternoon, but at midnight, 20 armed men who were masked took him from jail, dragged him to a livery stable on West Tamichi Avenue where he was hung. None of the 10 men were ever found out. He was hung on, the, on a, a rail where a livery stable was, a little sign on West Tamichi Avenue. 
Almost all of the miners killed in the Jokerville explosion of 1884 were from the British Isles. A few immigrants from the Austro-Hungarian Empire came to Crested Butte from 1880 to 85. Jake Kochever, Steve Yelenik, John Pasek, Mar Matt Malensik Sr., and Joe Rosman. What's Joe to you guys? Never heard of Joe? Between 1880 and 1885, he, they were all from Slovenia. Now, a little history lesson before we go on. We're going to talk about the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and the Russian Empire. All three of those empires in the 19th century were beginning to fade. The Russian Revolution would occur in 1917. The Tsar would be killed, and Nikolai Lenin and the Communists took over. The Ottoman Empire was headquartered at Constantinople, now known as Istanbul, and it included an area called the Balkans. And that involved Turkey and Bulgaria and Albania and the, the whole area of southeastern Europe. And in that area, the word Balkanization, that I always tell my class, that means divided up, chaotic, civil war, chaos, one valley against another. And the Ottoman Empire was ruled by caliph. If you people see or read about ISIS today, that's what they want to do. They got one to one, have one guy over all the Muslims. And Mustafa Kemal took over in Turkey, and he ruled Turkey. But he never could control those minority peoples. And then there was the Austro-Hungarian Empire, just simply known as the Austrian Empire for a while. In 1273, a family called the Habsburgs took over the empire. And they were able to take over the empire and rule a lot of these minority peoples for a variety of reasons. And one of the reasons was they were on the winning side in some wars. Another reason was marriage. Nobody was ever better than the Habsburgs in taking a young lady here and marrying this lady off to the gentleman here who is the upcoming king of Slovenia. The third reason that they are able to take power is luck. I've never seen any family as lucky as the Habsburgs. And the fourth major reason that they're able to take over is, is probably the, the best one of them all, and that is they had enormous support from the Catholic Church. And the head of the Habsburg Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, for a long time was the, quote, Holy Roman Emperor. The Pope is the religious ruler of the world, and the Holy Roman Emperor is the political ruler of the world. Frederick II, the greatest of all time. It had been great if he had been religious. Frederick the Great one time conducted an experiment. And the experiment was he took 50 children from noble families, very prominent families, and he kept these kids incommunicado for three years, trying to figure out when they finally took them out of isolation what language they would speak. Anybody got any idea what language they spoke? They didn't speak any language, never hurt anybody. He was a scientist. He made the famous comment that mankind had been deceived by three liars, Moses, Christ, and Mohammed. And he said nobody should ever believe in anything unless he can prove it by reason. Would have been great if he had been a little religious. The Austrian Empire included areas that later on were known as Czechoslovakia, Italy, Yugoslavia. Italy was not a nation in 1861. Napoleon looked at Italy and he said, Italy, and he sniffed in the air. He said, don't talk to me about Italy being a nation. Italy, he said, is a geographic expression. 
The Italians wouldn't have known what to do if they went to the bathroom together because it was made up of six independent city-states, Venice, Milan, Naples, Florence, Genoa, Pisa, and each one of them was independent. Venice, for a long time, one of the great civilizations in the world. Christopher Columbus, coming from one of those city-states, coming from Genoa. Now, there's one problem when you have an empire. Lord Turgot of France said one time, empires or colonies are like fruit on a tree. When they get ripe, they drop off. In other words, empires never last very long because colonies never like to remain colonies forever. Did England find that out in the American Revolution? Did the French find that out in Canada? Did the Spanish, uh, Spain find that out in Spanish America with Simon Bolivar and a lot of others? You're damn right. You're never going to hang on to an empire very long. The major ethnic groups in the Austrian Empire included Germans, Czechs, Slovenians, Slovakians, Croatians, Serbians, and Italians, and they all hated each other. And a big movement came in the 19th century, and it was led by a guy named Black George Petrovich from Serbia, which wanted independence, and it was called Pan-Slavism. And what Petrovich wanted to do was to get every Slavic group of people together and have one country with Serbia as the leader of them all. Today, you know, the United States and Russia, Vladimir Putin we know is in the Ukraine. Uh, when it comes to Serbia, Russia stands shoulder to shoulder with the Serbians at all times. Because they're both Slavic countries, and the Serbians are Greek Orthodox. And I think a lot of times our guys running the government have no appreciation for history. For instance, in the Middle East today, I mean, anybody could tell any of these hotshots who get involved in the Middle East that these people have had tribal rule for about five or 6,000 years and they ain't changing. I don't care what, how altruistic our motives might be. In 1848, there were revolutions. And King Ferdinand, the Austrian head, is kicked out and an 18-year-old nephew named Francis Joseph became the emperor of the Austrian Empire. Eighteen years later, because Hungary and Magyars, Magyars are the elite military aristocratic unit of Hungary, because they were pushing for independence, Austria decided that they would allow a dual monarchy, and in 1866 it became known as the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Every empire collapsed in World War I. It's over. Austro-Hungarians done. Two new countries created out of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. One is Czechoslovakia, the Czechs and the Slovaks together with the capital at Prague, and the other one is Yugoslavia with the capital at Belgrade, and one of the great cities being Sarajevo, where World War I started when they killed the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Franz Joseph, in 1848, now had to deal with all of those minorities. And all those people were poor and agricultural people. They were mostly Catholic, and many of them had been forced into the army of Austria. By the 1890s, they were on their way to the USA. Many left their provincial agricultural villages where they had orchards and vineyards, and they came to the U.S. Now, my father came from a suburb of Antwerp, Mirnix. And I remember him telling me when they went through Ellis Island, they had a spray, they sprayed everybody for lice. 
Nobody could speak the English language. Nobody had very much money. Nobody really knew where they were going. And, uh, you know, you look at those people and you say, unbelievable. There's no way I could have done it. Maybe I could have if I'd have been with them. But I'm probably too weak to do it now. They didn't have very much stuff. They weren't walking around like this, you know, checking the damn iPhone out when they went through Ellis Island. All of them were seeking a better life. Coming into Crested Butte were people that were Slovenians, Croatians, Italians, and Austrians. Mostly Slavic people. They were completely ignorant about mining. They knew nothing about industrial jobs. And for many people who saw these folks come in, they were considered stupid because they didn't speak the English language and they knew nothing about mining or industry. They're farmers. The Slavs in Crested Butte kept to themselves very early, crowding into a good number of boarding houses. Many Slavic women ran them. A woman by the name of Margaret Gobelich always looked at a prospective boarder's hands before accepting them. If they were not rough from work, the man was turned away. Many of the people who came were young and single men, forced to leave their families behind. Relaxation and companionship were found in the saloon. Glow, I hope you're taking notes right now because you wanted a saloon story, and here's one. There, and I'm quoting, one could not only drown one's sorrows, overcome one's weariness from hard and long toil, and meet one's fellows, one could also buy steamship tickets and money orders for folks in the old country, play poker, eat, dance, have one's letter written, enjoy meeting a girl, subscribe to newspapers, pay one's lodge and club dues, and if the saloon keeper was on friendly terms, even one's church dues. I hope you caught that part where I said they sent money orders back to the old country. Are the immigrants doing that today? you damn right. And boy, I tell you, those people back in the old country appreciated it because they were living hand to mouth. Most businessmen in Crested Butte got their start by running a saloon. Martin Verju was the first Slav to own a store. He competed with seven other stores, including the Colorado Supply Store, that's the CF&I store, and he grossed $90,000 in 1926. That's gross. That, that's not net. You've got to pay the expenses, but that's a damn good amount of money during a time when the U.S. really was in a depression. You don't hear anybody telling me about the Roaring Twenties. The Roaring Twenties were roaring for about the upper 1% of the people. The other 99% were pretty much in a depression. John Rozick, R-O-Z-I-C, another Slav, ran Rozick's bar on Elk Avenue after coming to Crested Butte at the age of 21 in the year 1888. Later on, he became a rancher and a businessman, and he died in 1947. Very early, the Slavs were detested because they took jobs, were Catholic, didn't speak English, and then when World War I broke out, they became very suspicious because the Italians and the Austrians and the Germans were all on the wrong damn side. And a lot of these people in the newspapers, if you read the newspapers, they're almost considered traitors. Periodic strikes hurt the immigrants in Crested Butte. The first strike came in 1890 in the coal mines and led to the Italian Council in Denver to ask the Elk Mountain Pilot newspaper in a telegram 
begging the miners to stop the strike against the CFNI and, quote, trust in the justice of the authorities, unquote. Another strike came in 1903 when the United Mine Workers under John Mitchell called out 150,000 coal miners nationwide. This led to George Baer, B-A-E-R, head of the Reading Railroad and also owner of many coal mines, to say this in a congressional investigating committee. That's all you need to know. This, this proves what I've been trying to tell you. Quote, the rights and interests of the laboring men will be protected and cared for, not by labor agitators, but by the Christian men to whom God in his infinite wisdom has given the control of the property interests of this country. We're not amused with this riffraff. God has given control of the property interests of this country to the Christian men like George Bear. This led Peter Dunn, who wrote under the subtitle of Mr. Dooley, one of the great writers in America, one of the great humor writers of America, to say this. What do you think of the man down in Pennsylvania who says the Lord and him is partners in a coal mine? Has he divided the profits? Crested Butte women, who spoke no, spoke no English, Learn to shout, go home scab, at passing strike breakers. Sylvia Smith, the fiery editor of the Crested Butte Weekly Citizen newspaper in the early 1900s, wrote very negatively about the Slavs. Quote, a fracas occurred at the Croatian saloon Sunday night. A number of Emperor Joseph's former subjects got into a wholesale mix-up in debating the work or no work idea, and the fighting host would have filled the trenches with corpses if the sheriff had not shown up. Sylvia Smith later on went to Marble, wrote very negatively about the Colorado Yule Marble Company, was thrown in jail and sent out on a railroad the following day later on sued the town of Marble successfully for $52,000 for a violation of civil rights. She didn't take any crap from anybody. <laughs> Paul Panyon Sr., in 1903, tried to rid Crested Butte of scabs who gathered at the Croatian Hall Saloon. He lit the fuse to 12 sticks of dynamite, but was unable to get into the building. Instead, he hurled the powder into the street, blowing a huge hole, but injuring no one. I can't imagine what 12 sticks of dynamite would have done. One of my jobs in the summer was working with dynamite, blowing up stumps and rocks on a, on a road job, construction job. And I can tell you that one stick of dynamite caused a lot of trouble. And you got to be careful with the stuff because when dynamite sweats, you know what they call that? Nitroglycerin. And about one or two drops of nitroglycerin could take out a couple of tables. And the miners always kept that dynamite frozen. And then to unfreeze it, they would put it on the stove for a little while. And unbelievably, uh, sometimes they kept it on too long and, and <coughs> big explosions and a lot of guys really got nailed. The Colorado Fuel and Iron Company had a company town in Crested Butte. You want to buy something, you buy at the company store. You want to live in a place, you live in company housing. You want to play, you play in the company playground. And you get paid in script. We're not paying you in money. I'm paying her in script. Now you can turn that into the company store or the company playground or the company housing and that's used for money. She goes out of Crested Butte, it's worthless. So did the company get all of its money back? Hell yes, they paid them off in script. Exploitation of the workers, rampant in the coal mines of Crested Butte and around the nation. 
to help the immigrants in Crested Butte, fraternal societies were founded nationally and then spread to Crested Butte. And these societies wanted to preserve the culture and the Catholic Church. The first fraternal order in Crested Butte came in 1893, founded by the Slovenian people, and it was called St. Joseph's, a fraternal order. We had get together and you could have companionship and raise a little money, have a dance, etc. Another one was called Eagles of the Plains. Another one was called the Society of St. Barbara. The Croatians started the Society of the Blessed Virgin Mary. All members paid dues, went to church, and helped out anybody in need. Marching came on holidays or whenever a visiting dignitary came into town. And the fraternal parades were very colorful. They had flags, and all members wore uniforms. The Catholic Church was very important, and they held dances to help pay for New St. Patrick's Church. Everybody know where St. Patrick's Church is? I think it's on Maroon, isn't it? Yeah. Maroon, west end of town, yeah. First, yeah, St. Patrick's. The church, however, became overbearing. The priest demanded a $10 fee for saying Mass in town. Local people were bled white to contribute to state and national organizations, but were heavily scrutinized. Now, I grew up in Belgian farming community. We had a French Catholic priest named Father Coignard. Now, what I'm going to tell you is true. Your seating arrangement was based on how much money you gave to the church in the envelope every week. So, if the gentleman here gave five bucks, that's considered pretty good. He is in the front row, middle pew. If this lady here gave 50 cents, she is in the back row, right-hand pew. Now, Father Coinyard, to make sure everybody knew what was going on here, he read... He read everybody's name and how much they gave as the Mass started. <laughs> Is it Archambo? Yeah. Archambo, one dot. He couldn't say dollar. One dot meant one dollar. What is it, Holbrook? Holbrook, two dot. Everybody looks at Archambo and says, what the hell? Is she a cheapskate? She's given two, two dollars and she's got, he's got much money. Rosman, 50 cents. Oh, he's going to be in the back row, right-hand pew. Can you believe that? Yeah. And this guy ruled with an iron fist. I mean, when they had religious holidays, you're there or else, and you don't want to ask or else what. <laughs> and that certainly was true in Crested Butte. Anybody who was sick and getting aid from a fraternal organization was not allowed to attend any entertainment, do any physical labor, and certainly not be caught drinking. So if you're sick, you're sick. Steve Krismanich, in 1914, and I'm going to ask the group about this, set up a night school and taught English at St. Mary's Hall. St. Mary's bought the former Knights of Pythias Hall in 1902 for 1750 bucks. It was located on Elk Avenue, a big metal-clad building, jacked onto log rollers, and then dragged backwards to its present location on 2nd Street. Anybody know what building we're talking about, even if it exists? The move took a month with men working after their shifts or on weekends. Horses were also used. Crested Butte, at its peak, had eight fraternal organizations. When the big mine closed up in 1952, the Croatian Hall was sold seven years later in 59 to Dr. Hubert Smith of Texas, who used it for his Law Science Academy. The four remaining lodges, St. Joseph's, St. Mary's, Plains Eagles, and Columbine, met in Frank Yelenik's home. He was an officer of every one of the four. 
As more people moved out of town, the lodges ceased to exist. The women of Crested Butte were unbelievable cooks, and I still think are. Now, you guys are going to have to help me a little bit with the pronunciation. Kabasi, Kabasi sausage. Now, this one I'm not even going to try. H-A-J-M-U-T, soup and stew. Hajmut. That's close. Hajmut, soup and stew. Uh, Povitica, P-O-V-I-T-I-C-A. No, 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 not a pizza. This is nut bread. Yeah. 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 I got potizza here, something else. No. No. Same thing. Right. Stand, that's what I'm asking. Nut bread, it could have been cheese potizza. Okay, it been so you never heard of this povitica. Okay, eliminate it. <laughs> All nationalities needed heroes. Oh, okay, I'm old. I'm old. I finally thought about it. What is it? Imuk? Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> I'll pr practice pronouncing that. That's as tough as Vandenbush. <laughs> <laughs> the Slavs had Peter Zebrik, Z E B I C K, Zebic, of Serbia. In Crested Butte in 1911, he lifted the wheels of a narrow gauge flat car off the track and held on each arm a team of Joe Aker's draft horses pulling his arms together and setting both draft horses back on their haunches. The strong man. Names were altered also because of immigrants. Is it Frank Arajum? Was, Nick, was renamed by the English Orazen. Pete Kuznicic was called Kiss-a-me-quick. <laughs> by his neighbor. <laughs> now, I'll tell you a funny story about this. My mother, and my mother was alive, my dad died in 1990, and I used to go down to Denver, my sister's house, my mother was there, and I'd show slides of the old days. And I told them I had uh, four sisters there, and I tell my sisters, I'm gonna tell you something right now you don't know about dad. And they say, you're crazy. And I said, his first name was not George. He said, you're crazy. I said, Mom, that's right. My dad's name, his real name was Joseph. And when he came to the United States, the Belgians could not pronounce Joseph, and they translated into Jos. And Jos became George. <laughs> and in the last name, there are two S's in Van and Bush, and somehow that thing got dropped also. So when you came to the USA, a lot of changes were made in any immigrant family. The Italians were the largest initial group in Crested Butte. They and all the immigrants to town, came to town and they brought their customs, their traditions, their music, their art, philology that I already talked to you about. All were connected in some way with the mines. And Crested Butte, because of all these different ethnic groups, became one of the most cosmopolitan towns in all of Colorado. And I call it cosmopolitan because of assimilation. Cosmopolitan means very high civilization, and it means that you come into contact with a lot of different languages and a lot of different ethnic groups and a lot of different groups of people. I grew up in a Belgian farming community. All I ever knew was the Belgian stuff. I grew up in a provincial neighborhood, low civilization. So Crested Butte was a tremendous melting pot and a very, very high civilization. Now, we live right next to the Finns, Finnish people who worked in the woods. We were at farms in the high land. We looked down on the Finns. And when I was a senior for the prom, they had a very good-looking blonde sophomore named Lucille Lund. And I asked her out to the prom. And my mother and father were not happy, and her mother and father were not happy. But the arrangement had been made. And to the prom we went. And you could have cut the tension with a knife. 
and we were home again in 20 minutes. I mean, it was very uncomfortable. You didn't do that kind of thing. Now, once in a while, you'd have a marriage between two different groups that didn't like each other, and the mother and father never went to the wedding. Never talked to the kids for a year or two until a grandchild was born. And then there'd be a phone call, and obviously the mother, in a very gruff voice, would say, Sarah, we're coming through Windsor anyway, and they'd make up some excuse to drop something off. And they see that little baby, and they drive off, and the woman would say to the guy, well, you know, he seems to be treating her pretty well, and boy, is that Sarah a cutie, and she looks just like me. And then the next phone call would be, we know that you kids are struggling a little bit, and we don't want you to pay the price of a babysitter. We'll suck it up, and we'll come and babysit for you anytime. You, they don't say anytime we want, but you get the drift. And there's an old saying in history that goes something like this, and a little child shall lead them. All it took was that one-year-old baby. That ended all that nonsense about two people from a different ethnic group. Mrs. Sarah Allen was, and I called Lucille Lund whenever, I, there, I had two girlfriends. One was a rival school, and I called her. I, I always got something funny to say, you know. One, one's name is Joanne Lundberg. And I call her up and I say, uh, Mrs. Lundberg, she's it's Christoph now, but Mrs. Lundberg or Miss Lundberg, your transcript has been looked at in northern Michigan. We find some irregularities, and she always knows who it is. We have a lot of fun. We'll laugh. <laughs> Same thing with Lund. Mrs. Sarah Allen was born in Crested Butte in 1883. Her married name was Thompson. I interviewed her in Grand Junction, 1971. She remembered the town when it was Anglo and the Southeast Europeans came in. She told me that Italian women used to bake their bread in the coke ovens on Big Mine Hill. And the Anglo kids would gather around and watch. A can of beer would be passed around until it was finished. Then another made the rounds as they baked their bread in the Coke ovens. One Italian family, quote, otherwise clean as a whistle, kept a cow in the kitchen in the evening. Peter Rollo, an Italian, was involved in a knifing incident in 1900 and returned with a gun and began shooting. The Elk Mountain pilot said, Quote, the Italians make good citizens after becoming Americanized. The guy obviously had a little way to go. Much of the trouble in Crested Butte came as a result of Greek, black, and other strike breakers being brought into town. In 1913, a Greek was shot through the neck by an Italian in Little Italy in Crested Butte. He recovered, but when the news spread, 25 Greek miners came down from Floresta to protect their people. Sheriff Pat Hanlon of Gunnison ended the war which involved the wounded Greek and the elder daughter of the Italian. That's why the guy got his gun. He didn't want the damn Italian mixing it up with his daughter. Mike Welch, half Slavic, started the La Calabria Soda Water Bottling Works in 1899. It produced cider, soda water, mineral water, root beer, birch beer, and ginger ale. In 1970, I interviewed Philip Yaklich, who was then 85 years old, born in Slovenia, 1885, later to be known as Yugoslavia. He came to the U.S. in a French ship in 1904 went to Pueblo, then Irwin. Before coming to Crested Butte, he worked in the coal mines of southern Colorado and northern New Mexico. In Crested Butte, he worked at the Buckley, the Peanut, the Smith Hill, the Robinson, and the Pueblo mines, and also in Floresta. When he worked at the Buckley mine, just to the south of town, he rode a horse a mile to and from work. He told me the miners were paid on the contract system. You got paid for how much you produced. 
If you hit rock or the roof fell in, you cleaned it up without pay. They called that idle days. He described the work in the mines as dirty, dangerous, and hard. He also worked up at the Augusta Mine, a poverty gulch, for a few years. While working at the Buckley, he met and got to know pretty well a man by the name of Joe Berta, B-E-R-T-A. Joe Berta is uh, uh, buried near the head of Ohio Creek. His nickname was Joe Peanuts. And he's, his grave says, Man of the Mountains. One of the toughest guys I ever met, and a man who was involved in the Ludlow Massacre near Trinidad, but never wanted to talk too much about it. I had a good friend, a football player named Drew Sparlin, was hunting with Joe Berta one time, and Sparlin was sitting on a point watching for anything to come by, never heard a sound. And then Joe Berta tapped him on the shoulder and said, Hello, cowboy. And Drew Sparlin said, set the world record high jump. <laughs> Joe Berta would never talk about it, but had some very interesting stories that I never heard. Mrs. Yaklich, maiden name was Cochever, daughter of Jake Cochever, who came to Crested Butte in 1884. She was born in 1894, and her father opened up the peanut mine. She was the first Slovenian child born in Crested Butte. Mrs. Yaklich's mother ran a boarding house for 24 people in the early days. And in the early days, many of the Slavic people, she said, stayed home at night to avoid getting beat up because there are more Cousin Jacks around. When Mrs. Yaklich got married in 1908, there was a big reception, she said. Twelve Irish approached the ball, or the hall where the reception was, and asked, when asked if they were invited, they said no. Mrs. Yaklich said, if you come in, look, look what's waiting for you. Fifty big Austrians were there at the hall. That was one of the last weddings ever interrupted. Because the Irish would always interrupt these weddings and start a fist fight. They would spit in the beer that was brought from a bar to home. The Ku Klux Klan was very big in Crested Butte, and in Colorado, and in the U.S., and in Gunnison. And this is no stigma attached to Crested Butte because the Ku Klux Klan was big everywhere. I got a picture of the Klan marching down Elk Avenue, marching down the main street. H.L. Mencken said of these guys, they get, got the right to dress up in a uh, robe with a white hood and engage in hocus pocum. Anti-black, anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic, anti-Jew. You couldn't be elected to drain commissioner if you didn't have the support of the Ku Klux Klan or if you were not a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Ben Stapleton, the mayor of Denver, member of the Klan, Burning crosses on Lookout Mountain, Golden. Governor Colorado, member of the Klan in the 1920s. And ultimately, they got the Ku Klux Klan the same way they got Al Capone. Number one, by crusading and fearless newspaper editors. But number two, they got them on income tax evasion. Where'd you get all that land? Where'd you get all that money? Where'd you get all that property? Well, I killed a few people, I cheated a bit. Couldn't prove murder, couldn't prove armed robbery, but we can prove income tax evasion and to the slammer they went. Everybody thinks the Klan was a big Southern organization. There are more members of the Ku Klux Klan in Indiana and California than any other Southern state. Nationwide. They held parades in town and burned crosses. Now, you guys got to tell me this. Chocolate Peak, where the hell is it? In the town up here, Chocolate Peak. The road goes around it now. Is that that little hill? Yeah. Oh, okay, all right. Okay, good. Got it. Thank you. Well, it's that little hill. Where they got a little place where you can sit down up there, too. Yeah, it was Chocolate Peak back then. Yeah. Why in the hell do they call it Chocolate Peak? 
I have no idea. I'm, I'll, I'll be working on that. All right, as I, as I finish now, people, Crested Butte had a lot of prejudice, but never had any ghettos. It was too small for that. Disease was impartial. Mines were dangerous for everybody. And time had a way of healing things. It was ironic that by the time the Slavs and the other minorities found acceptance, they had become the dominant group in Crested Butte and no longer needed it. They were Crested Butte. One Slavic writer of Crested Butte said, uh, writing about Crested Butte said this, and this is so true, the sorrows and struggles, the hopes and deceptions of the first and the hesitations of the second generation left scarcely any marks on the present third, which by its education standards and ambitions can no more be considered Croatian at all, neither by authorities nor by themselves. Having in some cases changed their names for convenience, they are now Americans and nothing else, justifying the aims of immigration, justifying the hopes and dreams of their mothers and fathers. They were Americans. They arrived. The first and second generations of Crested Butte could never develop their full potential. The greatest memorial of these people will always be their work ethic, the fun they had, the strength in the face of hardship, and their very neat homes and gardens. So what I say is this. I always tell my classes, you got grandfathers, grandmothers, grew up in the Depression, World War II. When you go home, the first thing you say to them is, thank you, which we ought to say to our grandmothers and our grandfathers and all those immigrant people came to Crested Butte. I'm done. We're out of here. <laughs> Be done to next week. Thank you, Dwayne. My pleasure. Good luck.